Welcome back to the Leaders Who Love What They Do podcast. I'm Anne Collins, your host, and I'm delighted to share with you another inspiring conversation with a leader who loves what they do. For those who don't know me, I'm a qualified and accredited international executive and leadership coach, and I'm also the director of the Belfour School of English in France on the Swiss-German border, where I've lived with my family for 10 years now. I help high achieving executives working in global companies or organizations to build a career they love, to lead effectively with purpose and to have an impact beyond their organization, creating new possibilities for others. So today I'd like to welcome Rebecca LeBrock, an exceptional and experienced leader in the field of arts education, and in particular in the area of opera and singing generally. She has worked at Opera North, the City of London Symphonia, and until recently as CEO at the Voices Foundation in London. Welcome, Becky. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you. I was just wondering if you could tell us, please, a little bit more about what you actually do and what has inspired you most in your amazing musical and education leadership journey. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I've been um, leading organisations and um, educational programmes within organisations. And I think in terms of what I'm really interested in doing, um, within those roles is about creating meaningful and valuable solutions um, for, for, for people really and, and about um, ensuring that music which has this incredible power in our lives reaches as many people as possible. Um, I think in a nutshell that's that what I try to do and I'm very interested in the fact that talent of course exists everywhere and really trying to understand how we can harness um, these great arts organisations and their resource to bring benefit and value to everyone in society. I think many people would agree that at the moment that isn't always the case, that it isn't always the case that everybody benefits equally from the arts. We are publicly funded. Many organisations receive government money to do what they do. And yet many people just really do not know about the joy and excitement and connection that the arts could give them in their lives. So when I think back to my work at Opera North, I think the moment where my colleagues and I in the education department felt really clear on what it was we were trying to do was when we realised that we were in an opera company that had a really extraordinary resource, an orchestra, a chorus, a technical department, incredible art to share. And yet we had a very niche audience, really. You know, the opera audience is fairly small. And and we wanted to understand how could we make this resource be relevant and vital for the entire Opera North broader community, let's say. So the whole of Yorkshire, the whole of the north of England. Once we understood that to be our role as a department in that organisation, then we could start to create meaningful programs that that gave people those experiences so I think that that really is what what I want to be doing is to is to harness this resource um, and create opportunities and value for everyone through the arts what's inspired me most and I found this a difficult um, you know this is a difficult question really because there are so many inspirations that one you know has through one's life from the teachers um, that we learn from from our parents our families But I think to narrow it down a little bit, I wanted to really start with the colleagues and teams that I've worked with because I've had some really inspiring people that I've worked with whose dedication and imagination has really driven me. And it's amazing to see how committed people can be to a cause, how selfless um, they are and how much people really, really care about giving something to other people. And I think that's always been incredibly inspiring, that people can be working at any level in an organisation and have extraordinary strengths and talents, that as a leader, one can be so bolstered by and supported by. So I think that is an inspiration to me. And I also have amazing friendships that have come out of that. Um, all of the teams that I've worked with, I've got um, some some very great friends. So that's a wonderful part of, of the work. Um, and then, of course, sort of the leader um, examples around us. So, you know, I could pick out so many, but one person who always springs to mind as an inspiration would be Richard Farns, who's a conductor, um, an internationally successful conductor. 
but the way in which he carries out his work is with such deep humility and grace and authenticity. And I think he succeeds possibly more than anybody I've ever witnessed before in the way that he works, whether he's standing in front of a professional international orchestra or in front of 400 children who are playing open strings on their violins is the same. And I love that kind of respect, that belief that he has in people. And it shines through from the stage, you know, whether it's a nervous opera singer or a child on their violin, they respond so well to that complete belief. And um, I think, you know, it's extraordinary to be in such a powerful position and yet to show no ego at all. So I have found that inspiring and there are many other examples of that, but I think Richard really does stand out to me. And children, parents and teachers that I've worked with as well, you know, some parents who face some really distinct difficulties and challenges in their life as a result of poverty or challenging circumstances. And yet when they recognise what music can do for their child because they witness something, they do everything they can then to ensure that that child, that young person has continues to have that opportunity to grow through music. And I, that is a very moving thing to see when, when you see uh, a parent uh, recognize their child's skills, talent, um, joy, and want to create more of that for them. So I think those would be the top three. But I have to also say another, another inspiration for me is debate. And I think um, we've come to a point with technology where I feel that sometimes social media destroys debate. It cre- it polarises people. It creates a huge chasm between different viewpoints and removes all discussion and inquiry and healthy conversation so that people have become more and more separate. But what I've really enjoyed working in my sector is working with other organisations, being at conferences and events where debate does still happen and it can be fiery and people disagree and I'm always really impressed by those people who will stand up and articulate what they think in such a brave and courageous way even when they know that half the people in the room won't agree with them and just continue to acknowledge that there is not one right way to think or not one right thing to say but that actually you know human connection is about understanding each other disagreeing unpicking things and finding new ways forward and and so I think debate for me is another area of inspiration because sometimes I I myself don't feel brave enough to say say what I think if I think people might not like it and so when I see other people do that I'm always very impressed by that. Mm. And can I just sort of follow up on that? It's really interesting what you're saying, because I know that in the world of music education right now, there is a lot of debate, isn't there, about the future of music education and uh, at, at all levels. I know for, you know for many years, people in the music profession have been saying that music education needs to have to be more of a priority. What kind of debates do you think we do we need to have in terms of music education right now? That's a great question. I think there are debates to be had about how everyone can access it and how best we achieve that. Um, A lot of issue around policy and funding with that. I think, you know, that is really important, but there's also, there's a huge amount going on to be celebrated in in music education and a huge diversity in what is happening too. It's great. I guess I'm interested in, in the kinds of debates around what people might think of in terms of relevance and um, people describe certain music as being relevant to certain people or not being relevant to certain people and think about accessibility in those terms. And, and I'm really interested in that because I'm quite passionate that everything is accessible to everyone and that really the connection happens when the introduction or the education or the teaching or the when, when that connection is right. If you're learning something from someone, let's say, and it's not um, introduced to you and presented in an interesting and inspiring way then the chances are you probably won't connect with it but whenever um, I've seen young people being presented with something in an interesting exciting way they always connect so I'm very interested in this kind of avoiding shutting things down I think we're slightly at risk of that saying you know these young people from this background you know classical music isn't relevant to them Um, and I'm, I'm stand strongly against that I think all music can be relevant not relevant maybe isn't even the right word all music can have meaning and can be valuable to to all people and we can we can make our own decisions about that and I think that's the key and for me it's about empowering young people it's about giving them that cultural capital giving them the confidence 
to have experience, to have formed their own opinions about things and giving them the ability to do that. And so those are the kinds of debates I enjoy is the, is the debates around what we mean by access and what we mean by relevance. Another big one is diversity. And, you know, we see in our um, professional music organisations in this country that there's an issue with diversity. And personally, I think that education is where that change can be made. Um, and I think... Therefore, the music education sector has a huge power to enable people from all backgrounds to be able to not only access music education, but if they want to, to be at the top of those professions. So I think there's a huge role for music education to play in that agenda. um, And I hope that that will happen. And I hope the organisations that are focusing on diversity as professional performing organisations will recognise that what they need to do is put their resource into education if that's really what they care about. Because you can't have violinists from every background auditioning if they haven't started to learn music from a very young age. So if you really want to see change there, you have to enable it at the very beginning of children's lives. Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the earlier the better. Indeed. That's great. So I'd, I'd like to keep on the education theme because I know that it is something that you're, you're really passionate about. You've worked a lot in the area of singing and education. What do you think is so special and powerful about singing in particular? Singing is so comes so directly from our bodies and it is it feels like a sort of refined outpouring of emotion so it's a step on from crying or laughing it's a refined sound but it expresses those same emotions and all of the complexities in between so I think that's why so many of us connect with singing another reason of course is because everybody has a voice and and everybody can sing And I know that lots of people think that they can't, but that's because they've been conditioned to think that. And that's why the Voices Foundation is such an important organisation to me, is because its purpose is to create a generation of teachers who feel comfortable singing and and using music in their classrooms, so as to create a generation of children who all feel that they can sing and are connected with their inner musician. So that is the exciting thing about music, is the way that it comes without barrier, it expresses our emotions but it as I said in a more sophisticated idiom I love those quotes around um you know that uh, which I slightly agree with and slightly don't too but that when you hear a song that you connect with then it's the realization that someone else has felt that same emotion that you felt and I love those those kinds of ideas that it's the, the kind of recognition that you're not alone either sing a song or hear a song although I think everyone's emotions are unique so I'm not I don't entirely believe that idea but I think I think it's a it's a great idea still this idea that that music shows us not only our own emotion to us but also the emotion of others but but in such an you know it's not brash is it it's it's so it's so careful and so thoughtful and yet so meaningful and I think so so really it connects us and isn't it wonderful that you can sing the exact same words and notes as 50 other people and create one sound but your individual sound is still there and maybe it's not distinguishable but it's there and and yet so are the other 50 voices and I always think that's just an incredible thing when you hear that and as a choir you can create moving and inspiring music no matter what level you're at whether you're a beginner or a top professional and I just think that's that's a very particular thing about singing is that and all music but particularly singing is that it's the truth it's the kind of ultimate in a single purpose and and, in a a group of people uniting in a single purpose and in that moment when you're singing together as a choir you you're breathing together there aren't very many other examples of things in life where we are that united with anybody else so I just think it's pretty extraordinary when you think about it that not only you you know exposing your own emotions on some level but also doing being able to do that either on your own or with other people and being able to do that however good or professional or, or amateur you are that it creates meaning for other people who are listening so I just think it's an incredible form and the fact that everybody has a voice the fact that you don't have to learn the technical difficulties of an instrument you don't have to buy an instrument you can just do it and I think that's a, a very powerful thing about singing. 
Yes, yes. And I think it's interesting what you're saying, essentially about the democracy around singing. Everyone can join in at their own level and still sing together and produce something that's uh, very emotional, both for those who are taking part, but also, as you say, that for the people who are listening as well. So, yes, an, an incredible medium. And I think uh, maybe very closely related to that, I think, is probably your work with children. And I know that uh, you're very passionate about working with children who are disadvantaged. I was just wondering, what have been some of the most satisfying moments in your career in regards to that mission of making music accessible and also as you said earlier about literally changing the lives of children and their parents as well when they realize the power of music really I'm interested in everybody no matter where they come from being able to participate in music in whatever way they want to or not to to choose not to but to choose it having experienced it and I suppose my focus uh, personally on those who wouldn't normally have those opportunities so those who experience disadvantage let's say is purely because I'm not worried about the other people because they are already accessing it or they could do if they wanted to so you know really for me it's about everyone and I guess that's the same for most people in my sector the most satisfying moments well it's hard really not to go back to some of our experiences at Opera North because as a team there we we worked really really hard to to think about what would be the right programs, what would produce value for our participants. We worked, everybody worked really, really hard on that. And I also think that we produced some really exceptional projects. So one project was the launch of the Opera North Children's Chorus, which still exists 10 years on. And um, that was 90 primary school children being led by some really exceptional choral leaders, professional choral leaders, two of them, Rachel Staunton and Justin Doyle, who are in other inspirations in my life. And those children, within two years of, you know, none of them had sung in a choir at all before. And within two years, they were singing The Ceremony of Carols by Britain. And that in itself is an achievement. That They sang it with Harry Christophers and the 16 wow. at, yeah. at the Spitalfields Festival with no music in front of them. And what was brilliant was the 16, the professional professional choir, were standing there with their copies and they were surrounded by 90 children, you know, from age 7 to 13, with no copies. And it was just brilliant. Amazing. And I remember Harry Chris was just saying, you know, that that when he looked up as a conductor to catch the eye of his performance and and there were sort of 180 eyes on him when he's used to having maybe three because, you know, or or four maybe, because... uh, Because people are looking at music, I think he just, you know, he almost, he said, I almost didn't know where to look because <laughs> oh, everyone's yeah. looking at him. So I think that, you know, that was an amazing experience. And I just love the quality of children's voices in that music. It's so, um, it's so earthy and, um, and real. And, and yet they could also make beautiful, refined sounds too. And then I think the, the other project that really stands out for me is In Harmony at Opera North, which was a program in a community in South Leeds, working with a couple of primary schools there. Every child got an instrument. And um, we thought long and hard about how to launch this project because we wanted to make sure that from the very beginning of the project that the children would feel a real sense of excitement about having instruments, that it wasn't something ordinary or, you know, that they could just brush aside, but something that they would value from the very beginning. And we had this incredible launch concert where we put the orchestra in the middle of a huge um, recital room but not on the platform but just in the middle of a the Howard Assembly Room in Leeds at Opera North and then we put the children around them around the edges of the room and the children didn't have instruments and they didn't know what was happening so the orchestra appeared Richard Farns appeared they played music by Britain uh, Stravinsky I think uh, Mozart Bach And the children just started miming on their instruments, pretending to play stringed instruments or, you know, whatever other instruments were there. And they were all just miming. And they didn't know at this point that they were going to get instruments. It was just this, it was sort of slightly kind of heart stopping moment where you thought these children are so um, engaged in this, you know, they're so excited by this performance and they still don't even know. And when we told them at the end, you are all going to have one of these instruments. I mean, the, you know, you could hear a pin drop. It was just that they could, they really couldn't believe it. And I think when I, we then shift from that launch moment to them performing in their first concert in Leeds Town Hall with Richard Farns conducting the whole orchestra of Opera North, the whole chorus of Opera North, soloists, and then 400 children are both singing and playing on their instruments. And then the parents afterwards, just talking about that experience of seeing they they were completely awestruck. I don't think they'd ever believed that their children should 
have an entitlement to music anyway. They, they, I don't think they thought that these kinds of experiences were really something they ought to ever have access to. And seeing their children on stage with an orchestra and chorus, it was a light that they'd never seen before. I think, I think just made them realize that they, they do have a right to everything that there is to offer. And more than that, that their children are talented and, and given half a chance will, will be able to move people to tears with their, with their performance and will be able to inspire everybody around them. So I think those moments, there are lots of case studies of, particular families and particular children along the way. But I think really it was those kind of those coming together of many, many, many children and families to perform that, you know, where there were young people from from families who wouldn't ordinarily participate, um, have opportunities to participate in that kind of quality of of music making. Those have been very exciting moments for me beautiful moments and and I love that story of the of the children miming and then getting their instruments afterwards I can just imagine the the emotion for the children and I'm sure it's something they'll never forget an amazing gift that you've given those children along those lines and you've touched on it a little bit so already you know when you're talking about how music can be so empowering and how also for the parents as well of those children that they realize they maybe see their children in a different way for the first time you know musicians develop a huge range of personal skills and mindsets in their journey to become professional or amateur and we know that they work very very hard what do they do to get there how do they get to that stage and and what kind of skills and mindset are they using and what do you think leaders from other sectors could learn from musicians it's a brilliant question well they are incredibly dedicated people who take on what can seem like an impossible challenge both the act of learning a piece of music that they don't know, you know, decoding that because it's written down, you know, in a notated form and they've got to decode that and interpret that for themselves. And then to stand up on a stage and perform it uh, in front of people. Uh, and I think kind of courage um, and bravery and resilience is, is completely amazing. To day after day, put yourself on the line and come out of it and then do it again. I think shows that these people however nervous they might be feeling they have a steely core and but also there's a huge generosity um, in all of the performers I know to give so much in terms of engagement and communication to give so much to their audiences trying to tell a story they are trying to reveal something to challenge people through their performance And it takes a huge, huge amount of summoning up of emotion and energy to convey that successfully. And I just think performers are incredible for their ability to convey really subtle and uh, minute things, as well as some of the bigger emotions. In summary, I think there are so many things one could take really from what a musician does to what a leader could learn from them. And I was thinking, what what would I learn from a musician? And my husband is a professional opera singer, so I, I was thinking a little bit about what I learned from him. And I think there is something about the learning and the practice that musicians do that is strategic, really, because the way that they will work on something tiny in a piece of music that's tricky and spend most of their energy and effort on those more difficult areas rather than going over and over and over something, I think is... You know, it's a very focused way of working and they're always problem solving. So if you know, rather than just keeping approaching the same passage that's difficult, let's say, in the same way, it's finding a new way to approach it if it's difficult. So always finding new ways to improve, always problem solving. And I think that those are important elements of, of good leadership. Then I think there's the aspect of performance, really, and just um, that communication and engagement um, an emotional connection, which is so important also in leadership and, and in performance as well. I think a musician has to take their audience with them. And, and I think for a leader, you have to take your team with you or you have to take and your stakeholders and your colleagues, you have to take with you and all of your customers. So I think that that's an interesting one, too, in terms of being able to to influence and to communicate with engage with and and be aware of of your audience and then finally I think the big one really I think is around resilience because I was thinking about when you make a mistake in music um you can't stop and dwell on it you have to keep going so you have to move straight past it I think that's a really really interesting (laughs) concept at the end of course you do recognize where you went wrong and you and you take that on board and you consider how you'll do it next time but there's just this kind of 
need to recover quickly because the mistakes are just gone in a puff of smoke. There's nothing you can do. So you have to keep going. And I just, that's the big thing we all learn, don't we, when we're doing our kind of violin grade two. The violin teacher says, whatever happens, just keep going. <laughs> and I think that's it, isn't it? Just keep going. Keep moving forward. Keep looking ahead. I think leaders have to look ahead. Um, they have to stay focused on the, the macro goal. And yes, they reflect on what went wrong, but then recover quickly reflect address it and move on and I think that that so that resilience to me is is a great great quality that musicians have and a great one for leaders to learn from I think that's brilliant wow such a so many leadership lessons in there uh, amazing I'd just like to take you back to the courage the point about courage and I know it's it's slightly linked to resilience maybe and um, but I'm very interested in what you say about courage but also the generosity and and the way that musicians they want to communicate something and I'm just wondering do you think that the courage maybe comes from this fact that musicians want to share something so that becomes the mission and does that help them to to have that courage because they they're focused on the on the mission as it were to communicate the emotions and the feelings behind the music I think that's right and I think the difference between a really extraordinary performer and then somebody who loves um, to sing or make music I describe myself in this category but perhaps isn't a kind of a comfortable performer is absolutely what you just described it's this kind of instinct this absolute desire to communicate um through that medium i think that is what drives it because i don't think you would do it otherwise i just don't think you know one would stand up on a stage and sing or play an instrument with the risks the inherent risks of that unless first of all you thought you were very competent and you know if you worked hard enough you'd be able to get through it but also that you know no matter what anyone says about you you know you have the bravery and the courage and the resilience to get through that what the critics might say or what even just your general audience might say about you that that actually for you it's to do with the fact that you are you are sharing as you said you are sharing something that you feel is important and that's that's big enough to to enable you to do it I think you're right I think that's something like that because otherwise I mean I know that there are lots of professional musicians who do feel nervous when they go on stage but the way that they channel that into positive energy it has to come from some bigger mission like you say around conveying meaning and emotion yes and I, and I think it maybe comes back to what you said right at the beginning about the power of music being around joy and connection and I wonder whether for these performers whether they might not maybe articulate it like that but maybe as you say it comes from that instinct to to bring that joy and connection to other people and to to bring that beyond beyond their own practice room where they can enjoy their own music but actually they they want to go much further and uh, and share that with so many other people so we've come to the end and what a lovely conversation I could keep going it's so, we've got so much to talk about here and can can I ask you for your final top tip to leaders no matter what sector whether musicians or not what would be your top tip Becky? So I, th- I, I think um, for me there's something around where a leader enables and where a leader stretches um, and I'm thinking really in terms of you know, the, the whole, thinking about the organization as a whole um, in terms of enabling an organization and also stretching it towards growth because there's no point leaving an organization unless it's growing. So that's that's what leaders are trying to do. And so I th- but I also think of that in terms of the people that that one works with as a leader. And I've always felt very privileged to be surrounded by people who've got such diverse strengths and qualities. And you know, often I think, especially as a young leader, you know, if I think earlier on in my career, I would sometimes be aware of a weakness of mine and I wouldn't quite know how to how to deal with that. And what I've learned is that there's always somebody there in the team who's got the strengths that you haven't got or they can challenge you on something or they think they just have a different way of thinking about something. So for me, I think it's about enabling those people around you to reveal their strengths and and to then be able to harness them as well so I think I think about it in terms of at the one end one sort of enabling the people around one to to reveal um, themselves um, as leaders themselves within the organization and at the other end I think there's a responsibility also for leaders to sort of stretch the organization and those people so I think it's something about that I think it's something around remembering to harness everybody and everything that's around you um uh, because actually ideally you know one isn't leading alone one is leading with other people and I I love the notion of 
everybody being being a leader really in the organization of course one person might have the responsibility to be accountable and um, to the board etc for that but actually that everyone can take a leadership role and it's about enabling everyone to do that and that within their role mm, that's great yeah I love that idea of leading with rather than just being the being the lone leader and everyone being a leader that's great well thank you so much Becky it's been such a pleasure to have you with us today it really has and and I've so enjoyed our discussion about the power of music about the, the the way that that can be used to empower and and really change people's lives and then also your approach to leadership which seems to me to embody exactly that that you're empowering people and um, no matter where they are in the organization and that you, you're seeing you're seeing what people can bring at, at all levels and as you say stretching to go even further so thank you so much that's been really great can I just ask you because I'm sure there will be listeners who would like to contact you how what's the best way Way to get in touch yeah absolutely i'd be delighted to hear from people and uh, happy to be contacted via linkedin okay great well i'll put that in the show notes well thanks to you our listeners for joining us and if you've enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to help us grow the podcast please hop over to apple podcasts and rate review subscribe and share so this is Anne Collins. Thank you so much for joining us and for listening. And do join me again soon to meet another inspiring leader who loves what they do. Goodbye. <laughs>